Whatever your poison, beer, wine, the fanciest of cocktails, alcohol has been one of the great social lubricants for eons. Now, provided it's consumed responsibly, of course, it can be one of life's great pleasures. But is there a best way of drinking it? To find out, three international guests will reveal some scientific secrets on how your favourite drinks really work. But first... Hey, Graham. Andrew. How are you? Good. Nice to meet you, Graham. So you're a, a scientific bartender. What does that involve? I'm a scientist and a bartender, and I use my working knowledge of chemistry, biology uh, and physics uh, to be more creative with the drinks I design. Yeah, I, I guess when you think about it, there's actually probably quite a bit of science involved in making the perfect drink. Uh, there's plenty of science, but we'll go through that today. All right, what's the first drink? Uh, we're going to start off with a simple gin uh, and tonic. Good, one of my favourites. Um, was that invented in India? Uh, invented by the British forces to help them consume their daily dosage of quinine. What a wonderful medicine it is. Oh, it is. Quinine, the active ingredient in tonic water, has long been prized for its anti-malarial properties and not just for its distinctive bitter flavour. Uh, the first thing we need to think about is how much alcohol. Everyone has their own comfort level of alcohol. It generally sits around about 14%. So that's roughly the same as wine? Yes. So we're trying to dilute the gin down and we do that by adding 50 mils of gin and 100 mils of tonic. Uh, the next important thing is a glass. You're using that? Sure am. You normally serve gin and tonic in a long glass. I do, but the important thing about the gin is to actually get your nose in and be able to get the botanicals. The botanicals are the fruits, vegetables, spices, herbs, even flowers that give gin its unique flavour. All gin is made out of juniper berries. Oh, yeah. Have a taste. Oh, yeah, it tastes like gin. Yeah. The trick, I'm told, is to find out what's inside your gin and choose a garnish that complements, even improves, its aroma and flavour. And cucumber, not lemon. This one in particular, uh, we're going to use cucumber and rose to pair with the cucumber and rose within this gin. OK. Perfect gin tonic. I should taste it, I'm sure. OK. <laughs> that is a good gin tea. Very good gin tea. Thank you very much. So, Professor Andrea Seller, you know a few things about G&Ts. What can you tell us? So, gin is quintessentially a, a, a drink which is based on juniper, on the juniper berry. And a study of juniper berries that was done in about 2011 identified more than 190 flavor components in the mix. Among the, the, the many molecules that, that have been found in juniper berries is a molecule called eugenol. And these turn out to be on the whole, quite pharmacologically active. Now, eugenol, for example, is fairly well known to have a kind of mild analgesic function. And so drinks like gin will be using some of these botanicals to give you some of these curious sensations. What I would steer clear of is the idea that somehow or other these botanicals might actually somehow bring you health benefits or something like that. Um, remember that, you know, the alcohol is there at the 40% level and these botanicals are there in trace quantities. But a gin and tonic has another trick and this time it's about the tonic. Here we have some tonic water. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to shine um, an ultraviolet light at it. Can you actually see here that the whole thing glows blue. It's the quinine in the tonic water that gives this unusual quality. The molecular structure of the quinine includes this. It's called the quinoline ring. When hit with UV light, the electrons in the quinoline ring become excited and the molecule begins to vibrate. As a result of this energy, the tonic water glows. Well, that was a perfect g &T. What about something that's not a cocktail? Well, let's talk about champagne. Champagne is a sparkling white wine that's been double fermented, and it's this second fermentation that gives the wine its carbon dioxide content, those all-important bubbles. And there's a simple trick you can use to keep it that way. Most people pour their champagne while they're at a Christmas party. Why well, just pour it straight into the glass? Yeah, you're losing all the gas. In fact, research conducted at the University of Rams in France showed that if you pour into an upright glass, you can lose as much as 50% of the bubbles in your bubbly. 
See, what you need to do is pour your champagne more like a beer. Oh, yeah. So you're trying to avoid any fizz up at all, really. Absolutely. And, of course, it all comes down to a taste test. And that one should taste a that lot flatter. That one's a lot flatter. Yeah. Ah, there you go. You know what you're talking about. Someone else who knows what they're talking about is now joining us from University College London. Champagne's a really unusual drink because the bubbles that we're all so familiar with, that we associate with champagne, aren't just pretty little things that sit on top of the drink. They're doing things. And so, unlike any other drink, champagne, when you pour it out, you're, you're pouring an engine. And the thing that makes champagne interesting is the effect its bubble engine has on its flavour. So as the bubbles are rising through the liquid, they're not just passing through it, they're dragging the liquid with them. So they're dragging the liquid up like a kind of upside down fountain. But they're also, as they pass through the liquid, collecting molecules on their surfaces. So as they rise, all the different flavour molecules that are in the liquid um, are bumping into them. And some of them, and it is only some of them, are sticking to the bubble surface. And then they get carried with the bubble up to the top. So it's the bubbles that are choosing the flavour of my champagne for me? That's right, so you don't get a choice. If you drink the drink, when you drink the liquid, you do get the whole thing. But because smell is so important, a large part of your experience is dictated by what the bubbles choose. So last thing on the menu, we have the martini. Ah, very good. So shaken or stirred? Well, that's the thing. It could be both. Andrew's perfect martini recipe involves a ratio of six to one gin to vermouth. Generous amounts of ice, shaken or stirred, then strained into a chilled glass with a complementing garnish. Two martinis. Enjoy. <laughs> Things I do for the program. Actually, you can taste the difference. Absolutely. I'm surprised. Yeah. A bit hard to put into words what the difference is, but quite different. Shaking a martini is said to sharpen or freshen the flavours, while stirring keeps them rounded. But, Graham, I think you should be aware that it's not just what's in the glass that defines the taste of a drink. I think there's a lot more sort of psychology involved in tasting than many people realise. Professor Spence, thank you very much for joining us from Oxford. What other factors can influence the taste of a cocktail? So I think uh, flavour involves all the senses. The research from our group and other groups now clearly demonstrates that the colour of the lighting really does make a difference to what you taste, what you get out of the glass. Perhaps the clearest results come from when you play with kind of red and green lighting, and there we find that people will rate, say, that red wine as about 10 to 15% uh, fruitier uh, and hence sweeter under the red lighting, whereas when we switch to green lighting, suddenly that brings out the kind of fresher, the more sort of acidic and sour notes uh, instead. But it's not just light that can change a drink's flavour. Professor Spence and his colleagues have discovered that music also has an effect. Music and sounds don't really have a literal taste, do they? And yet I think they can uh, and do quite dramatically affect our experience of what's uh, in the glass. One might take uh, bits of uh, Saint-Saëns' Carnival of the Animals, uh, and that has a lot of tinkling, high-pitched uh, piano in one of the pieces, and that's very good for bringing out sweet tastes. If you want to bring out bitter notes or chocolatey notes, there's a kind of lower in pitch. So we might use something like uh, Camino Burana. And there we find if we, if we play the matching music, uh, we can bring out, say, the sweet taste or the sour taste in the drink, again, by about, um, about uh, 5 to 15%, just as a function of the music in the background. So there you have it. The perfect drink is not just about what's in your glass. It's a multi-sensory symphony. And that's some science we can all drink to. Thanks for your time. Cheers. 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 Cheers.